So we left off talking about the elements of design last time, and I just want to continue on with that conversation. Remember, as we talked about the difference between elements of design and principles are like the difference between architectural plans and building blocks or brick. Now, this applies to all type of pictorial arts, right? In design class and drawing class, printmaking, the uh, painting class, it's just dependent, the mediums, you know, are different. Um, but the same, the same sort of elements exist. They exist in slightly different versions because of the mediums, but the principles are the same as well. So let's look at some different things. We talked about line before, and I just want to point out again that lines are really in relationship to each other, um, both physically like parallel lines, right, or converging or intersecting lines, you know, the way that they relate in space, but also the quality of the line is in relationship to each other, right? These are very angular sort of lines, vertical, horizontal. But if I do things that are wavy, you know, that's part of it. But another part of it is thickness and thinness of line, right? It has a very different feeling to it. And then lines have other qualities, like we could say dashed, right? Zigzag versus wavy. So you can't tell a zigzag line very well if all of your lines are zigzag, right? It doesn't have anything in contrast to it is a better way of saying that. So a spiral line looks a lot more, or a biomorphic irregular shaped line looks a lot more irregular shaped when it's next to a bunch of boxes especially if the boxes were a complementary color then you're really showing the difference between them so this is how sort of ele elements inform each other and similarity and difference and all the principles we could talk about for a really long time interrelate this is an example of pareidolia i mentioned before um, that we see human faces and even simple lines, and we want to see those sort of faces. We want to see faces and things. So be aware of that when you're designing and drawing and thinking that things are going to automatically read. We read an image like something, such as faces. Let's talk about line quality. And that's something I already started talking to you about on the last slide. But I want to show you this again to say the medium is a part of that as well. So this is how it applies to different mediums in the sense that this is brush with ink. And this is an ink pen or nib. Same medium, but the way it's applied changes the quality a lot. These type of terms like could also be considered line quality terms like a regular line, wavy, etc. This piece I mentioned before and I mentioned before um, is a printmaking piece so it has a quality to it because of the etching and I want to show you this to say again or if I didn't talk about it already that the lightness and darkness of lines is also quality and it makes things come forward or go back into space which is happening here in this piece types of line actual line the most obvious sort of line you're like yeah of course it's actual well we're going to look at types that aren't so actual this is straight up contour line this is called a contour line all of it's there fully visible doesn't have to be black and white. These are all actual lines as well by Steinberg, a different type of cartoon. But they're actual, fully there, and present, contour line. Is there actual line in photography? Interesting idea. 
Maybe we could say that's an actual line, and these are actual lines, albeit this one I think is getting more into shape, and these little ones could be more of a line. The thickness of them becomes more of a shape. So yes, other mediums we could say have actual line to them. Implied line. Now, A is an actual line, B is implied because our I creates it. You're like, well, it's a line. Well, no, because it has little spaces in between it. Our I creates the line, especially here. So that's an important thing to distinguish between what kinds of lines are you seeing in a piece, implied or actual. Psychic line. This one gets a little more esoteric. But what it is is the way in which your brain connects things together like a line. This is Carvaggio from the 1600s, a uh, narrative from the Bible where Abraham's about ready to sacrifice Isaac, but the angel points out a ram to sacrifice instead. Very strong um, psychic lines between Abraham looking at him, his finger pointing to the ram, the ram looking back, Isaac, the knife being connected to him. So very strong psychic lines because of the subject matter, but also because of things like the pointing and the eye direction. So it's an important part of it. We have to create a relationship between things to create a psychic line, and pointing does that very strongly because our eye automatically goes to where it points. But in this piece, it's also we know where people are looking, and so there's a psychic line very strong that way as well. Is there a psychic line here? Yes. The horse is looking at the man, the man is looking at the road, and his feet are moving towards the horse, and the horse is moving towards him. So it can get a little more complex, but it usually has to do with us knowing for sure there's a direction that's being pointed to. Contour line. These are like actual lines in that they're um, fully there. These ones kind of get a little more broken. The difference between them is that they're defining the surface of a form rather than just the outline. So the way that they're going convex and concave, convex and concave, and by the number of lines, it's defining the form by going about the surface. Lost and found contour. The line goes away and it picks it back up again. Just down here, it gets lost on the edge of the beach and then we find it again in this photograph. This is actually maybe closer in certain ways to gesture line, but it has some lost and found contour, which we'll talk about gesture. I put that there to show you the difference actually. The line is lost and found. This is moving freely about the surface to define the form. And so sometimes people think gesture is lost and found, but it's more about your line of sight going away and then picking back up on it. These are gesture type of drawings. Sort of sketchy, but really it doesn't have to be messy. It's about your form, the form being defined by the pencil freely moving around the surface. Lines are used a lot of times to build up values, so modeling values, creating value through extra lines and the shading. You could use the side of a pencil, ink, different things, but when you do line assignments and values, you need to do it through hatching and cross-hatching. So this is hatching, cross-hatching. It's not, when you do those type of assignments, I don't want you to just make it a flat black shape. It needs to use the line work. Shape is an element of design. There's all sorts of types of shapes. Um, they're in also like the line in comparison to one another. So you have a reg, a irregular or biomorphic shapes versus regular or geometric type of shapes. There's open shapes, which our eye completes, sort of like implied line and closed shapes. There's a lot of different types of words we can use to describe shape. And it has a psychological connotation, like he's such a square, meaning boring. Um, we have a clear line of thought. Well, it means we're going in a direction. So 
in language, these type of um, forms and shapes and materials sort of have connotations. And so it's something to think about when you're designing something. Picasso is using shapes of color in his cubist style that he invented with Brock back in the early 1900s. Shape becomes volume in actual 3D space. And then this is the illusion of volume through using perspective systems of de creating depth. You can't poke it into the paper. It stops, it's flat, versus this is actual shape. Negative space shapes and volumes are shape and space. So that's part of shape. Brings up this idea of positive shapes and negative spaces and the way in which shape is related to form I talked about earlier, um, but is also related to um, uh, space as, a, as an also element. So these are positive shapes, the black, the negative space is the space in between. This is Kara Walker's work. She does um, pretty interesting work with silhouettes um, about race and identity and pretty strong graphics sort of work by using the silhouette and black and white. Positive shape is any shape or object distinguished from the background, and negative space is the unoccupied areas, empty space around it in the composition. Example here, positive shapes, negative space. Pretty clear. Sometimes people do this to mess with you know, visual gestalt and how you see. And so this would be a funny case of it's a vase, it's two faces, it goes back and forth, your eye moves back and forth. Some people can't see one or the other, or some people like me keep switching back and forth between them. So space is also an element, um, and it's very much connected to shape. So in this, this is the actual positive image the shape is the white, the black is the negative space, but someone created this by filling in the negative space. Another part of space is the illusion of depth, and perspective is a huge part of that. There's different types of perspective. This is like the mathematical two-point perspective based on things they observed in the Renaissance, the way in which lines converge um, over things converge over long distances, and as they converge, they diminish in size. Parallel lines, I should say. Make that very clear. Um, this is parallel to this, so it goes to the same vanishing point off here on the horizon. But if it wasn't parallel, it would be a set, different set of vanishing points. So this is a way to create an illusion of um, depth. Here it's happening in three points. So that's an important thing you learn a lot about in drawing class, and we, we use it in other things as well, painting, you know, design. Foreshortening is an interesting thing. Um, it's part of this. So it's the distortion of objects that are poking out towards the picture plane to make it appear that they're coming towards you. In this case, the feet, the hands, different things are getting bigger than they should be or being distorted, and other spaces are getting compressed, and so that's how foreshortening works. Another example of it from a comic by Guy Delis, a French comic, uh, graphic novelist. Value is an element of design. I like it to be separate. Sometimes people will combine it with color. Like I said, different systems, I've said this before I believe, but if I haven't, different systems of the way people group things, they have names that are this, talking about the same thing, like principles of design, they, um, unity, you know, will sometimes be called cohesion, or they'll say different types of words, but they're talking about the same thing. So sometimes people group value with color because color has value as part of it. I like to kind of separate it out a bit to make you understand it in the terms of black and white um, and gray as well. And it's very, very much um, about what's around it. So this shows you that 
the middle dot is the same gray, but depending on what's around it, it changes dramatically. So achromatic value, achromatic means no color. Chromatic value, meaning with color. This is very, very neutral colors, but still it's not achromatic. There's um, browns and yellows, oranges, greens, blues, very dulled down in saturation and um, very grayed out, but there's definitely chroma happening here. Colors have very much a relative value, even if they're translated into black and white or gray, um, which is important when you're trying to draw something realistically in a black and white medium and the object is actually colored, it's not black and white. You could think about the local color, which is what that's called, the yellow, blue, red of it, and try to translate that into a gray. And then it's going to change a lot depending on the light that's on it. Terms we use for values, shading is on a subject, shadow is what's cast by it. And light is a huge part of how we see. I mean, if there's no light, we can't see. It's in the dark, right? So that's pretty obvious, yes. But it also informs the way we see color. So if you go back to this, if the light's hitting from this direction, the color of the yellow in the light would be much brighter and in the dark, much darker, right? In the shadow shading side. Well, it's going to change the color that we perceive. Has the color of the actual object changed? No, it hasn't. So depending on the way the light is working, it'll change the effect, the visual effect. This is something you could study a lot in physics, refracting light um, through, you know, rain is rainbows. And rainbows have Roy G. Biv, red, orange, yellow, green, green blue, indigo, violet. But it's, it's something we can really um, observe in nature, but we can also study in the way in which things, um, the way in which things absorb every color and reflect back that color. That's how we see color transmitted to our eyes. The visible light spectrum is a lot of frequencies, and then there's infrared, ultraviolet, ones that we can't perceive with our eyes. So it's it's a really interesting area you could study. Um, like it says, the color of an object is not actually within the object. Rather, the color is in the light that shines upon it, and it's ultimately reflected or transmitted to our eyes. So that's, that's kind of complex and gets almost philosophical in a lot of ways. It's really interesting. So we're mixing pigment, pigments that we use in paints um, and printmaking ink, etc., etc. We're actually, in a way, mixing light, and it's subtractive. It's the thing absorbs everything and and brings back or reflects back the color. Just a bit of color theory. Color is a really, really strong, expressive um, element. Primary colors are the ones we can't mix: yellow, red, blue. Secondaries are two primaries, right? And then tertiary colors, something you maybe not heard about as much, are a primary mixed with a secondary. So that's how you get a tertiary color. Hue is sort of a color family, the basic color family, red to yellow, blue, everything in between. We use that term hue, like it's of a blue hue or greenish hue. Um, some people sort of also use it in regular language to be a particular color too, so you kind of get a little slippage there, but generally it should be in this sense of a basic family. And this shows you what I already said before, value doesn't just correspond to black, white, and gray. It's also these. A couple things you'll hear about a lot of times is a tint, which is a hue in the middle plus white, a tone, which is a the pure hue plus gray, so this is tint, tone, and then shades are hues plus black. Here's the pure red going to shade into to shade into tint. Pure color is the most intense, has the highest saturation, 
so we talked about saturation in that term, but also sometimes people will say intensity, and it's sometimes known as chroma. So this is a kind of example again of how you have different terminologies. You got to keep them kind of straight depending on what you're reading. They may use a different word but mean the same thing. We talked a lot about intensity, meaning colors are clean or dirty. They've been grayed out or muddy. They'll say dirty, muddy, grayed out, and then clean, bright, high intensity, a lot of chroma. So I just wanted to make, make sure you sure you knew about this tertiary intermediate before. I didn't really have a clear slide. So here it is, yellow, green, yellow, green, in between. Um, I also put this here to show you what we're going to be talking about next, which is associated colors and analogous colors and associated colors, like yellow and blue make green, and these ones are by each other on the color wheel. So this shows you associated yellow, red, and orange, and you can make a whole composition out of that yellow, green, and blue. It feels very unified, and... Um, even though it's very different, it also feels like it belongs together. Analogous are the ones by each other on the wheel, and they feel unified for a different reason because they're all warm, for example, in this piece. Or you could do them all cool. Another thing that we talked about is monochromatic, which is what we just talked about. One color plus its tints and shades. So one color plus black and white is a monochromatic piece. And that would be, this is a pretty close example. It's breaking with it a little bit. One way it's breaking with it is that little bit of red right there. And it's getting some more yellow in it. But I show this because it's near monochromatic. And it shows you another design idea, which we're going to be leading into, which is certain colors make other colors show up a lot. So green, all green, this little bit of red pops out a lot as a focal point because of the, the red is opposite on the color wheel. So these are called complementary colors. Not complementary, like free, complementary. They give each other a pop. They're opposite on the wheel, and they make each other stand up. Blue and orange, red and green, yellow and purple, that's the um, primary colors with the, with the secondary color. So if you notice, with red, and, with red and green, just as an example, how do you make green? Well, you make it from yellow and blue, right? Well, the two other sec, uh, primary colors makes this secondary color, and it's the opposite. So every one of these would be a complement of each other. It doesn't just have to be a primary is what I'm trying to say. Each one of them has an opposite. That would be a complementary color. This is really important because when you're painting, um, you, even in drawing, besides just making them pop out, you can also make muddy or brown or grayed out type of colors this way. This is an example of using a lot of blue and orange in the piece. You know, there's other colors, there's green, but a lot of these neutralish colors, neutrals being colors that aren't are more like grays, but grays and browns. Um, are made through this idea that when you mix a complementary color with another with with each other, when you mix them with each other, you end up with neutral colors. This shows you how they can be used for a really really nice effect to give us a lot of energy in our visuals, and this is using a lot of blue and orange. So different shades and tones and tints of blue, right? We have different ones, but they're still opposite each other. So you get a lot of blue and orange mix that pop up. It's not just blue and orange, but throughout it, there's a common blue and orange going all over the place. This is even oranges that are light and slightly different from each other. But back here, see, this is orange and blue. He's using even an orangish color orangish yellow for the streets. This is San Francisco um, kind of feeling. And the shadows are actually blue, so it makes things really have a lot of movement and pop to it. It's a very beautiful piece by Tegel.
This is another one of his pieces that just shows how expressive color can be. It really is, has a lot of psychological effect. Think about how people say red means fury, green with envy. Um, you have the blues, you're feeling depressed. So a lot of emotional impact with color. Texture is an element. It's real in 3D. This one kind of always makes me feel like I got my mustache in my mouth when I was drinking a cup of coffee. Um, but in 2D, it's created by the way in which we um, put marks on the page, right? But how do we see it in the real world? Well, we see it because of light, like we see everything else. But it's little indentions in the way surfaces um, create shadow and value shows this texture. And if something's really shiny, we know it's shiny because it's reflecting light back. Reflective light shows us that it's smooth and shiny. It means it's smooth, right? If it's shiny, it's smooth. Because different objects absorb light in different ways, bounce it back or absorb it, we know that it has a certain texture to it visually. We just have experienced this so long in our lives that we just kind of innately know it. But when we're trying to draw it, we have to think about it a little bit more. You could experiment with this just by doing something where you lay a thin piece of paper over something like wood and um, you rub it with some charcoal and you'll get an actual texture but it will correspond to and look similar in a certain way to the original. It'll be opposite for whatever's raised will pop out and whatever's lowered won't, so it'd be kind of different uh, inversion of it, but it'll still give you that same idea. It can be used expressively and conceptually in artwork, conceptually being the idea behind it. This is cool. Chuck Close actually applied paint directly with his fingerprints to make this image of his grandmother, his wife's grandmother. And so this is him doing it over and over again to create value through his fingerprint. Why would he do that? Well, what are fingerprints? They're a lot about identity, right? Personal connection to your fingerprints. They take them when you um, when you have to do certain type of legal things to be notarized. There's lots of things that fingerprints are, but they're particular to an individual. And so there's a commentary and an interesting relationship between his particular identity and this person. And so that's the conceptual part. But also it's using a formal part that fingerprints do have value to them when you put them in ink, the raised and lowered parts. And so he's playing with that as well. David Hammond says that, and he's a really interesting artist. Um, he's a black artist who does a lot of really interesting work um, about identity and, and some politics and a lot of other type of interesting stuff too. But these are made with basketballs and the texture of the basketball. And talking about, you know, we have bl black asphalt down below. Um, so talking about some interesting things about urban environments. Another element is time and motion, which could be actual time and actual motion. For example, in some types of sculpture, kinetic sculpture actually moves. And then we could have a two-dimensional actual time and motion with film and video art, right? Um, the way in which film has gotten included in fine art video is a whole branch of art now and projected in performance and things like that. Um, those are all part of art in the contemporary world. But this is actually the essence or feeling of motion in this sculpture. And it could be through transformation, like successive changes is something that has a feeling of movement or motion or time. Actually, not so much motion as time, but transformation of time like a plant growing or something changing. Um, and then there's an implied line that creates it in a lot of pieces, you know, like speed lines here. That's a way of creating time, uh, time, a feeling of time and motion, like it's going past or it's about ready to hit something. A couple more terms just to talk about before um, we wrap this up just a few slides more. I want to just say, because you'll hear these terms, style is elements combined in a characteristic way. 
So this is the characteristic way of Van Gogh, but it's also a Prost Impressionist characteristic way, which is dabs of paint thickly put onto a surface creates this care this style. And what are the elements? Blue, yellow, paint, shapes. There's a lot of things we could talk about here. Line. But they're done in a characteristic way, and that's how we get the, the term style. That's what people are referring to. There's a lot of other terminology. Um, we hear subject matter, content, representational. Um, and we're just going to go over a few of them really quickly. So subject matter is the thing that's actually being depicted. So in this case, a knot from Louise Bourgeois' childhood. She used to have to repair tapestries, but it's also on a rock. So that's the subject matter. What's being shown or depicted or created apart from the content, which is this content is the meanings that we get out of it. So what's being shown in the material it's being shown in, how it's being shown formally, and then you get content, which is what we're talking about meaning. Interesting here, Warhol is using one of the most recognizable images in the world that's very, very much one of a kind and valued because of its individuality and one of a kindness and making a repetition of that to talk a lot about um, the modern world and critique it and, you know, doing a bunch of stuff about degrading the, the image, degrading it. So that's content, but what the actual subject matter is Mona Lisa in silk screen and paint, right? This versus this. This has a one type of content, and by doing this to it, he's using that content and image and subject matter from the past and making it into something completely different, flipping it on its head. Representational, you'll hear that word, or figurative. Figurative really just means representational, but you often hear this word has been appropriated by a lot of people, and it's, up, it's actually correct, I guess you could put in quotes, to mean figures um, as in human figure but it also ultimately means representational you can tell what it is it's representing something it doesn't have to be naturalistic it's just representing naturalism is more or less how we would see it, it doesn't have to be um, hyper realistic but it's representational it's naturalistic more or less how we would see it this is pop art by oldenburg you know it's been adjusted and made bigger and kind of funny because it's plaster sculptures with paint on them but it's still naturalistic realistic is taking it up another notch where it really starts to feel like we would actually see it van eyck self-portrait so it's more more real than naturalism right it's of course it is naturalistic but it's even more so so it's realistic and then illusionistic takes it up another notch to where we believe it to be it's something. So this we almost believe to be a photograph, but it's a charcoal drawing. And this we believe to be cards stacked on a book, but they are slip cast, which is clay that's been cast into molds and painted and silk screened with things and fired to look like it. So that's illusionistic. Idealized is depicting standards of beauty that are generally agreed upon in a culture. So if something's been idealized, it changes from time in time, different time periods, different ideals in different parts of the world. Stylized is when things become geometric that would have not been geometric. Like on the surface, the hair the, of this wolf has been stylized. So it's about things becoming geometric. Romanticized is nostalgia, really, in, in essence. This guy, this painting's about a revolution, and so the artist has depicted, who do you think he's um, in favor of, the revolutionaries or the establishment? Well, I would say the revolutionaries, because there's a nostalgia or emotional impact to what they're doing. Even though it's pretty negative subject matter, it's been romanticized. We could say non-representational people will say, um, sometimes we'll use the word abstract or non-figurative. Abstraction is a bit different from non-representation. We'll talk about that in a second. But we could say 
the difference between them, you know, right here, representational, more or less something we can tell what it is, non-representational, not representing something. People argue this a lot because ultimately it ends up representing something, maybe the formal elements, art for art's sake, the artist's psyche, you know, there's a lot of argument about this throughout the history of art, but that's the term non-representational. An abstract um, is different in the sense that it is being simplified or the essence of something is coming out. It can still be representational and abstract. Or you could get into what people call pure abstraction, which is non-representational. So the terms get a little slippery sometimes. An abstraction would be on a continuum, like a continual amount of it. So we have like a cow here that Doz, Ben Dozberg uses as his starting point to create a non-representational pure abstraction. And he starts with something that's still somewhat of a study of a cow, right? Um, not the same as a picture of it, but you know, we could tell it's a cow. And he begins to simplify it down. Here, even though it's abstract, but we could get an essence of cow, then here it comes completely like non-naturalistic, um, no longer uh, associated with a cow really, unless I told you it's complete geometric abstraction. Geometric being the fact that it's all become regular shapes. So that takes us through our terminology and the elements. Um, just want you guys to review these slideshows and understand what we're talking about here to be able to you know, answer questions about it and to have the language of design for your project so we can talk to each other about what you're doing and kind of have a common language that we're developing throughout uh, all your art courses. All right, take care. Hopefully you're staying well out there.